can there really be no science? Hey, everybody. Welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host. And tonight I'm going over the case of Angelica Hadsill. Everything you will hear in tonight's episode is from NBC News Stateline, The Jacket, People Magazine, The Cineholic, 13 News Now, The Virginian Pilot, 10 on Your Side, and 3WTKR. I don't know either. Angelica Hadsell, who liked to go by AJ, was born on August 9th in 1996 in Chesapeake, Virginia. It was just her and her mom, Jennifer, up until about the age of when she was a toddler, and her mother met Zach. They ended up getting married and having two daughters of their own. AJ really never knew her father, so he became her father. They were just one big happy family. Unfortunately, after seven years they decided that it just wasn't working for them anymore. That it was time to get a divorce. AJ was somewhere like about eight, I do believe, when this happened. And it was hard on her, but she had to be there for her younger sisters. In 2010, Jennifer met Wesley Hadsill. They were only dating for a month before they got married. They also ended up having a child together. Wesley even went as far as to adopt AJ. She was going to Longwood University, and she was double majoring in information technology and computer programming. She was very smart and very motivated. She loved sports, too. She played field hockey, softball, and even swam for all four years of high school, along with volunteering for several charities. While doing all of that, she was even able to maintain a 3.8 GPA. In March of 2015, there was a lot going on, and it also happened to be spring break. AJ decided that she wanted to come home for spring break. Her mom and Wesley weren't doing so good. He had just been caught with drugs, so she kicked him out, and he was now living in a motel. She was going through a breakup with her boyfriend, Josh Campbell, and just the stresses of being a freshman in college. There was a lot going on. On March 2nd, around 7 a.m., AJ was speaking with her mom. Her mom was getting the kids ready for school, and she was on her way to work. She works as a contractor at a joint expeditionary base in Little Creek. As the day went on, AJ was in contact with her mom and her dad. She was replying to them, but they noticed that she was vague. That wasn't really like her. Her mom was like, hey, what are you doing? And the reply she got was, out with friends. AJ never responded like that. She was a good kid. She'd tell you who she was with, where they were, or where they were going. But her mom thought, you know, I mean, her and Josh broke up. Maybe she just needs to be alone. Or maybe she just wants to be with her friends. When her mother returned home with her sister, AJ still wasn't there. But what they did notice was her wallet was still there. It was on the couch. She still had her music playing. The laundry was only half done. And the door was unlocked, the front door. They just felt like something wasn't right. They do find a note from her that says, With everything going on, I need time. Her mom's thinking, all this is just off. This is an AJ. She never left notes before. Again, she's a good kid. She's going to tell you personally, either text you, call you, something. She's not going to leave a note. The next day, when they realized that AJ didn't come home, and now the text messages, she's not responding to them. Mom was reaching out to friends. Nobody had seen her. Alarm bells went off. So Wesley went to police so he could report her missing. Detective Benjamin took the case, and something that he noticed was just how everything was left. He thought either A, she was abducted, or B, she ran away. Everyone that they talked to said AJ would never run away. AJ was a fighter. What teenager is going to run away but leave their wallet behind? Wesley was also making posters. He was in the media constantly. He wanted everybody to know her face. 
They created a Facebook account. Bring AJ home. Now they got to start talking to people, especially the people who were closest to her. Wesley told them that he met up with her at the local gas station so he could give her some money, but she didn't tell him what it was for or why she needed it. They definitely want to talk to Josh. He's the ex-boyfriend, so they're thinking, you know, maybe he's upset. When he comes in for questioning, he tells them that the breakup was actually amicable. He had no ill will, and he also had an alibi for that day. They didn't exactly cross him off the list, but they, they put him in another pile. They also bring in Zach, the previous father. He tells them that he loved AJ, and he treated her as if she was his own. He taught her how to ride a bike, play sports... They had a great relationship up until they separated. He said something just changed, but he provided his DNA. You know, he had an alibi as well. He was working as a maintenance technician for a credit union and he was on his way. I did read in one of the articles that Zach and Wesley started a business for about six months doing like handiwork. But after it didn't really go anywhere, that the relationship between them two fell apart and they were no longer friends. Wesley wanted to be in front of that camera as much as possible. He wanted people looking for her. He told them that she was last seen wearing her blue like letterman jacket with her name embroidered. Now, Jennifer was a little different. She was asking them to respect the privacy and to leave them alone. She threatened to call cops on reporters. She told him, I'm not playing. This is not your situation. Please respect my family. And Wesley wanted them to put her picture everywhere. About three days passed since AJ's been missing. Corey French, who was a friend and actually an ex-boyfriend of AJ's, he was walking home from work and looked down on the ground and he found credit cards. It was AJ's name on these credit cards. So he called police. When police asked him, you know, when's the last time you've seen her? He said, I haven't seen her in months. Apparently, their breakup was not so amicable. Corey really loved AJ. After the credit cards were found, a few days later, police get another call. This call was from a man named Andre. He claimed to be in Corey's house. And he found the blue jacket that she was last seen in. So now they are like, what in the hell? When they bring Corey back in and they show him the jacket, he truly looked stunned. He had never seen that jacket in his life. He kind of freaked out. He was like, what the fuck? I did not take that jacket. I have not seen her. I don't know where that came from, how it got in my house. It was tucked behind a cushion in the couch. Since this jacket was found, Wesley decided that Corey had to be the guy and he was going to make his life a living hell. He would park across the street from this guy's house and have a air horn and in the middle of the night just sit and blow that bitch. I don't know how he didn't get shot by one of the neighbors. <laughs> like... He even ordered a pizza and had it delivered to his house. And on it, it said, I know what you did. He forgot last summer, but you know. About three weeks into the investigation, a call comes into 911 from a man stating that he's found women's clothing on the side of the road. They found a pair of shorts and a bra. The caller was Andre. And the person that was out looking with him was Wesley. They're thinking, what are the chances that they're going to find both key elements in this case, other than the credit card? You found the jacket, now you're finding this clothes. They press Andre pretty hard, because both of them were him. And he finally breaks and tells them that he didn't personally find the jacket, but he was told where he could find it. Wesley had gone to him and said that he broke in to Corey's house because he believed either there'd be some evidence in there or maybe even AJ. Maybe she was being held captive. When he was inside the house, he found the jacket, but he couldn't take it 
because he broke in. When they do a background check on Wesley, they discover he had quite the rap sheet. He was a bank robber, breaking and entering and burglary. Shocker. He was calling police constantly with tips. I got a tip that this is over here. I got a tip that this is over there. They decide, let's go check that gas station video surveillance. Let's see if, in fact, they are seen on the video. They watched before the time that he said he was there, after the time. They were nowhere to be seen on that video. They weren't at that gas station. So now they have probable cause because he lied. So now they can search his hotel room. When they were there, they found ammo, and he had that up in one of the vents. You're a felon. You can't have that. So he was arrested on March 21st for having the ammunition. They needed to take it one step further while he was in custody, and they checked his truck. Jennifer told him that he said he wanted to come to her work to switch out his personal van for the work van. So they checked both of them. In his truck, they found a scrunchie and a picture of AJ. In the work truck, they found a GPS. They decide, let's see his routine. Let's see if anything sticks out. For the most part, he does. He has a routine. But there was a slight change one day. He drove to an abandoned house, which is like 50 miles from her home. That van went to that location two days after she went missing. They also found a shovel, work gloves, and some duct tape. None of the other daughter's pictures were found on him. Only AJ's. When they go to this house, they look around, and it's all overgrown, And the detective said on Dateline, the jacket, that it was kind of eerie. It just had an eerie feel to it. They looked around. They didn't see anything. So he started to head around back. And there was kind of like a makeshift bridge over a drainage ditch. And there was a plywood board, which was their bridge. So he walks over to it and kind of uses his foot to lift it. Five weeks after AJ went missing, they found her. His GPS led them right to her body. She was laying in the ditch, face down. They also had phone records to show that AJ and Wesley's phones were pinging off of the same towers, heading towards that home. So authorities believe that she was forcibly taken from the house, While she was there folding her laundry, listening to music, they believe that mostly it was because he wanted to rape her. When her autopsy comes back, everyone's scratching their head a little bit. Her manner of death was heroin poisoning. AJ didn't do drugs, especially not heroin. So they go back to his hotel room and they do a deeper search. Up in one of the ceiling tiles... They found heroin. They were able to see that the day that AJ died was March 3rd. So she was alive for almost 24 hours, maybe a little more, I don't know exact times, with him. They believe he raped her and then forced the heroin into her body. Trial was in January of 2022. His defense said that AJ was depressed And she killed herself using migraine medication. Like, are you serious? Her mother took the stand and told them, like, there were no red flags. She never saw any of this happening. They brought his drug dealer onto the stand. And he told them that right after AJ went missing, he sold Wesley some heroin. He had this all planned out. This man tried to ruin that boy's life. He could have been locked away at the age of 18 for something he didn't even do. He planted the evidence. He made those text messages. He tried to frame Corey every and any way that he could. Of course, Wesley saying that he would never hurt his daughter. He did not do this. He did not have any involvement. He doesn't know who was involved. That he was trying his hardest to get this solved, not the one who was committing it. 
The prosecution laid out that he had a window of opportunity to attack AJ. He took a two-hour lunch the day that she disappeared, when they usually only take 30 minutes. He had a co-worker testify saying that when he came back from lunch, he was not his normal self. He seemed very preoccupied, kind of angry, so much that his boss sent him home. I was like, dude, you need to take that somewhere else. It took the jury 40 minutes, 40 minutes to come back with a guilty verdict. And he received a life sentence. He was never charged with a sexual assault, though. That's kind of like pisses me off. They're never going to know exactly what happened, but they do believe it was because he was obsessed with her and he was on drugs. Her mother, Jennifer, stated, You kind of look back and you start replaying events leading up to everything. And the last few times I saw her, when we were together, you try to find something that would raise a red flag. Now that you know what you know, and there wasn't anything. Her mother said, I do feel that she was taken from the house. I don't feel that she went willingly. That is really, at this point, the only thing that I would say I know that happened. Her mother set up a scholarship in her name. And to be eligible, you have to meet the criteria that reflect AJ's achievements. The winner has to have at least a 3.0 GPA and must participate in at least two sports for two years each. This case just kind of pulls on the heartstrings for all different kind of reasons. I could not imagine being in that mother's shoes, knowing that I brought this man into our home and he raped and killed my daughter. Absolutely, this is has nothing to do with her, not her fault. I do believe one month of knowing somebody and getting married, is it's not long enough. Sometimes 10 years isn't long enough, you know? Especially when you have children, you really have to be aware of your surroundings. I mean, it honestly seemed to me that, you know, her mom was lonely and she liked having somebody there to help her. He wanted to step up and she said, okay, you got to take your time with these things, especially when you have children. You just, you never know. I personally, I'll tell you what I think happened. (laughs) Cause you know, I think he came home and I think maybe he told her maybe that they were going to go somewhere else. And she's like, okay. And she went willingly, not knowing that this was about to happen. How would she have known that? The only thing about that is that she left the note and they did say, really looks, it's her handwriting. At just 18 years old, she still had so much to accomplish and she had the drive to do so, but she was cheated. What do you think of this case? How do you think it happened? Do you think she left willingly or not willingly? I think he should also be charged with rape, but. If you follow me on Instagram, you will see that I had very exciting news. I have now reached 10,000 downloads, so I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for listening. Making me a part of your routine, it really makes a difference. I am very grateful for all of you. Just make sure when you are listening, you like, follow, and subscribe. That way you'll know when new episodes are coming out. Find me on Instagram. Keeps you in the know, you know? (laughs) If you or yourself is also dealing with addiction, I have a substance abuse line there for you, and they will help you get the help that you need. All right, you guys. We'll talk crime another time. Bye.